Hey everyone, <coughs> oh Jesus, we're not doing that. Okay, <laughs> let's just roll with it. Hey everyone, it's Mark. This is my recap for Pokemon Horizons episode 29, Orla and the Monster Ball Artisan. No, why, why didn't I translate it? It's the Pokeball Artisan. I always translate the titles. Wow, this intro is an absolute debacle. But let's keep it rolling. This was the 1,261st episode of the Pokemon anime and the first of this series to focus on Orla. Let's talk about it. So after Liko reminds us that they're going to look for the Pokeball Artisan that Teppin knew, we see that Roy is getting up to some trouble aboard the Brave Olivine. Somehow he made a hole in the wall from practicing throwing Pokeballs. I gotta agree with Orla on this one, you should be doing that outside, Roy. We then see every other member of the crew aside from Liko and Ludlow jump in and ask for Orla's help because of some small issue that's going wrong with the airship. Orla is less than enthusiastic about helping everyone, but she goes off to do it anyways. Well, Liko makes note of how hard she works, and yes, I needed to use this screenshot because of Roy's funny face. The show skips ahead to when the Rising Gold Tacklers arrive at their destination, which looks like a Pokeball factory. The usual trio gets off the airship to investigate, and Orla comes with them this time. She's less than impressed with the factory, noting that it has potential but is way off mechanically. Just then, the shutters open and a shadowy figure emerges from the cloud of smoke and it looks like we found our Pokeball artisan. She seems friendly enough, inviting her visitors inside for some tea, only for this disorganized mess of junk to just fall on top of her, but she's staying pretty cheery about everything. That avalanche caused one of her Pokeballs to fall out and it's a replica of a Hisuian Pokeball. Our artisan friend mentioned that it's based off the Pokeball they used in Hisui, and I was shocked that no one followed up on this piece of information. Wouldn't it have made sense to ask her what she knows about Hisui if they're trying to track down Cleavor? But nope, instead she just introduces herself as Kana, and after they sit down for some tea, Roy brings out his ancient Pokeball to ask about it, and Kana freaks out at the sight of it, claiming to have never seen anything like it. So yeah, they went all the way to ask this Pokeball artisan about the ancient Pokeballs, and she had literally zero useful information for them. Great. We could just end the episode there, but we're just getting started, as Kana points out her collection of prototype Pokeballs and makes it clear that a lot of them don't work as intended. Roy gets fired up at the sight of these things and wants to know if he can practice his Pokeball throwing with them. Kana is fine with this, and she says that each Pokeball has its own design notes to go along with it. Roy and Coco run outside to try them out, but not before Kana warns them about the wild Pokemon in the area. The remaining characters turn their attention to one of Karna's machines in her factory, and she explains that it's used to mass-produce her custom Pokeballs. Then she makes this foolish statement about machines not being any good. Yeah, don't say something like that in front of Orla. Our resident mechanic invites herself over to the machine and starts investigating, and after some tinkering, Orla is able to get the machine working. Karna is impressed, but not as impressed as Sprigatito. I love the sight of this grass cat getting so easily excited at the sight of a pretty shiny ball. Orla celebrates her success at fixing the machine and uses a lot of the same verbiage that Karna used when she was describing her level. Of Pokeballs. From there, we check in on these clowns outside, and Roy is ready to test Kana's custom Pokeballs. He throws a bunch of them at this rock, but some of these outlandish designs aren't really that functional, as Roy and Poikoko would soon find out. While they're messing around with that, we catch a glimpse of a Galarian Weezing watching on from behind a nearby tree. Time skips forward to when Freed is back aboard the airship, and we see him, Murdoch, and Molly go around in a circle, accusing each other of giving Orla too much work to do, while the much more level-headed Diana and Cap watch on, knowing that this argument is pointless. Back over at the factory, Liko is messing around with one of the Pokeballs herself, while inside, Orla is showing Kana how to use her Pokemon to help make her machines run more smoothly. Kana is ecstatic about Orla's help and advice, while Orla is very complimentary of Karna's Pokeballs. Yeah, it's plain to see that these two are getting along real nicely, which Liko picks up on. While she's just kind of chilling in the background, she overhears Karna asking Orla to stay here with her, which shocks the other two. Karna says that the two of them could really make something special together, and Orla doesn't accept or reject her offer straight off the bat, but of course Liko is quick to fear the worst, and she doesn't want Orla to leave the Rising Volt Tacklers. Back over with Roy now, and the next Pokeball he's going to try is a Chase Ball, one that is designed to chase after the nearest Pokemon. And yeah, you can see where this is going. It runs into that Galarian Weezing from before, and instead of catching it, like any working Pokeball would try to do, this thing just hurts the wheezing and it is not happy. Yeah, cue the chase sequence, and while Roy is running for his life, Liko is busy thinking about Orla leaving the crew. Orla notices Liko and goes to talk with her, so Liko asks if Orla has fun every day. Orla says yes, she does, even though it can be hard work a lot of the time. Liko then asks why she started traveling with Freed, and Orla's like, oh, did I never tell you? And Liko's reaction to this was kind of funny. 
Anyways, we jump right into flashback mode, and I gotta say, Orla's story really struck a chord with me. Okay, not the working on a shipyard in Hoenn part, but rather how she enjoyed her work, it was fun and relatively stress-free, but she would often question herself on what she really wanted to do. Yeah, like literally my internal dialogue from the past two years or so, I 100% have the same kind of thoughts as Orla was having here. Unfortunately for me, I never had my childhood friend call and ask if I could build him and his Pikachu an airship. Not that I would be any good at building one, but Orla was excited to give it a try. She didn't really know if she could accomplish this, but she gives Free the credit for lighting a spark under her. Orla liked putting her skills to the test, and she even found out what it is she really wanted to do with her life. Before she can tell Liko what that is, here comes Roy and Foy Coco running from that wheezing. Liko tries to stand up to it, but Sprigatito is a terrible type matchup, and she just so happens to not have a tenna with her. How convenient. Orla steps into action, calling out her Metagross. Obviously, a Steel Psychic-type Pokemon is the perfect matchup against a Galarian Weezing, and one Metal Claw is enough to send this thing flying. It doesn't waste any time coming back, though, alongside an entire horde of Galarian Weezing. Fear not, though, that familiar Thunderbolt has appeared to save the day. It's Captain Pikachu, fresh off his critically acclaimed surprise appearance at the climax of the previous episode, he's back again, making quick work of the Weezing he battles. As much as I can make light of Cap always coming to save the day, I wasn't hating the scene as much as I initially thought I might. Freed realizes that there are so many Weezing that even Cap might struggle, but he has some epiphany when looking at the factory's smokestack. He yells down at Orla and asks if she can make the machines run faster, and he even drops in the same can you do it line that Orla pointed out of that flashback just a moment ago. This unsurprisingly strikes a chord with Orla, so she heads inside to get to work. It seems like the machines are going to overload, but Freed keeps asking for more, and Orla trusts that he has some idea. Eventually, the smokestack nearly explodes, sending out a ton of gas into the air. That must be terrible for the environment, but it does cause the Weezing to flock to the smoke. Liko's Pokedex reveals that Galarian Weezing consume gas like this, and in return, they let out clean air, so Freed used some of his Pokemon professor knowledge to distract the Weezing. We cut to later that day at sunset, and it looks like Orla has rigged up a feeding station for the Weezing so that they can help filter out the contaminated air that the factory produces. We then see Orla decline Kana's offer to stay with her, but the Pokeball Artisan isn't surprised in the slightest by this. She offers Orla a fancy Pokeball as a parting gift, and Orla smiles and winks and reminds Kana to do her maintenance on her machines. Kana winks back and asks if Orla will come back if she forgets to do that, and Orla says she'll even come back from the ends of this earth. Whoa, when did these two get so serious? As the brave Olivine makes its departure, Liko asks Orla what it is she really wants to do with her life. Orla explains that she wants to do things she has never done before, and that traveling with Freed on this airship would surely lead to a lot of firsts. Again, this is pretty similar to my outlook on life. I relish any opportunity to broaden my horizons, and Orla suggests that Liko has done the same thing, joining the rising world tacklers in order to experience something new. This wholesome moment is interrupted by the entire crew yelling for Orla's help again, just like at the beginning of the episode. As she walks off to get to work, we see Kana's gift sitting on Orla's work desk, and that's how this episode comes to an end. Unfortunately, no wrapping for me today. If you missed my last episode review, I made a diss track about Luop and how I beat him in a competitive Pokemon match recently. It was amazing and horrible at the same time. The next, and hopefully last time, I'm going to rap is when I hit 10,000 subscribers, so make sure you do your part and subscribe so we can all laugh at my attempt at performing the Rising Voltaglers rap. Moving on from that though, let's talk about this episode. I want to start with my rating this time around, and I'm giving this episode a 6 out of 10 rating. Yeah, it was fine, but nothing special. Sometimes I feel like a 6 out of 10 is just kind of like my default rating when I enjoy enjoy it, but don't have anything too remarkable to say about an episode. The pros definitely outweighed the cons this week, and I have no major complaints. I touched on how Cap's heroic arrival didn't bother me as much as it did in the previous episodes, and that's mainly because this wasn't an actually serious confrontation, it just more so was a plot device to highlight Orla and hammer home everything we had learned about her in this episode. Sure, it made me laugh when Cap showed up AGAIN, I mean the gall the writers had to make Cap save the day in ANOTHER episode, that's almost as stupid as Kana's smoke output, I mean good thing Orla made it so the Weezing can convert that gas into clean air. This tiny factory must have been terrible for the environment. No wonder Galarian Weezing lived around here. Getting to learn more about Orla was nice. I expect us to get similar episodes about every member of the Rising Volt Tacklers, and this was the first time Orla was in the spotlight. All of this was prompted by Kana, who was a fun but unspectacular character of the day, in my opinion. And as I pointed out in my recap, she didn't give any useful information about Roy's ancient Pokeball, so the Rising Volt Tacklers are back at square one when it comes to finding the rest of Lucius's six heroes. And I don't know if you noticed, but this is the first time throughout this entire series that we ended an episode without knowing what was going to happen next. The first 28 episodes of Horizons all ended with either a cliffhanger or a direct tie-in to the following episode. The overarching plot has advanced with every single episode, until now. I don't want to make it sound like this is a bad thing, by the way. Having a streak like that for the first 29 episodes of a series is phenomenal, so this is actually a really good thing even though the streak has come to an end. 
I honestly don't think any previous series has even gotten past its first 10 episodes, keeping the week to week continuity going, so it seems like the writers really took the complaints about Journey's feeling too episodic to heart and made Horizons feel anything but episodic. The next episode looks like it's about a Pulte guy sneaking around the Brave Olivines, so I'm not sure if we're going to find out the Rising Bull Tackler's next move at all. They currently have no leads, I guess besides Dot researching for Rayquaza's location, so this episode may just be complete filler. On the other hand, maybe this Pulte Geist will be important. I've suggested both in my reviews and in my Discord server that I hope we get to see some more wild Pokemon deciding to live aboard the Brave Olivines, so maybe that's what will happen with this Pulte Geist. Or maybe one of our heroes will catch it. Maybe Orla with her special Pokeball? I doubt that, but I do hope we get to see Orla make a capture with that ball one day. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching this video. Personally, I am very impressed with myself for getting through this entire thing without making a joke about balls. And on that note, be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.